Welcome to Collected Talks of David Solomon, podcasts on Jewish history, the Bible, Jewish mysticism, philosophy, and thought. Find out more about David's upcoming classes, publications, and other recorded lectures by visiting davidsolomon.online. And now, here's the lecture. If you've noticed that the last three weeks, we have spent looking... Are there comments now, are there? We've got things to say about this map I've been drawing? You've come to realise how brilliant it is? <laughs> we have come to look predominantly in the first three talks at things that were going on in Europe for the most part. In the first talk we spoke about uh, some of the major background issues to the 18th century, some of the great uh, debates and divisions, personalities, but really to give ourselves a sense of what uh, was the context of what was going on in the 18th century and the challenges. And in the second talk, we talked about the rise of Hasidism. In the third talk, which was last week, we spoke about this, this twin pull, if you like, between uh, the rise of an intellectual rabbinicism uh, in the 18th century uh, to counter the Hasidic, but also that there was this intellectual pull back to the West uh, through the Enlightenment and so on that created the conditions of uh, the Haskalah. And we looked, therefore, predominantly at the concept of the shtetl versus Berlin and all of those issues. And then when you step back and you realise that really all those three talks are focused on Europe, and yet we know that if this was even approximately to scale, then really the world is going to be like basically this whole space around here, and Europe is just a small corner of it. And so you say to yourself, well, is Europe really all that's going on in Jewish history? And it most certainly isn't. Uh, we learn about Europe because primarily, I think, because of the fact that Europe went ahead and kind of created the modern world and uh, created the conditions by which the 19th and the 20th and 21st centuries we know had come about, we tend to focus on Europe as being the source of all the action. But there are phenomenal things. It's only really Europe in the 18th century really is kind of only a footnote to what else is going on. And tonight I'm going to try and condense and give us a picture of what the 18th century represents in the Jewish world outside of Europe. And if you recall... Uh, Look, just this afternoon, I made an amazing historical discovery that I'm going to try and share with you because it falls bang in the context of what I want to talk about tonight. It's very, very recondite and obscure, and I'm not expecting, I'm not going to load this talk with it, but I'm going to just raise it. Then, hopefully through the talk, I'll show you how interesting this idea develops. As you may or may not know, I don't spend most of my time teaching history or teaching uh, courses. I spend most of my time in translation. And one of the uh, books that I have been extremely immersed with in the last few years are sections of the Zohar, the latest strata of the Zohar, which I've been translating from Aramaic. And that's been a long journey, and uh, it's partly why I'm in Melbourne. But uh, I did spend three years between about 2012 and 2000 to 2014. I translated a very important text called the Tikkune Zohar. It's a stratum of the Zohar that had never been translated. It's like the Everest of translation. No one really wanted to go near it. And I was foolhardy enough to do that. And I sat down and I translated it. And in order to translate something, you have to choose an edition that you're going to translate. Who is familiar with any of the famous translations of the Zohar that have emerged in recent years? Okay, then we can forget that, but that's okay. I chose to translate a very influential edition of the Zohar, of this particular section of the Zohar, which was printed in Constantinople in 1740. All right? Mm -hmm. So the production of this wasn't the first edition, it was like the fifth or sixth edition of the Zohar since the first edition 
in the 16th century, in the 1500s, but the 1740 edition of Constantinople became the standard edition of all subsequent editions. So even though there were earlier and potentially more influential editions, there was one that came out of Amsterdam, there was one that came out of Mantua, there were different very important editions. It was that Constantinople edition that became definitive. And that has always perplexed me. How is it that Constantinople produced in 1740 produces the edition that is going to go on and become the standard edition when you see the history of the last 250 years has really been about the rise of European culture and between all the Hasidim and the Midagdim and Askala and the Jews of the New World how is it that that edition and some of you might be sitting here going oh David that's very obscure uh, you might need to take some medication and calm down. <laughs> but what you realise is that when we study history at a deep level, all of the artefacts of history are important and the distribution and canonization of texts is an extremely important measure by which we can understand the influence of different communities and the influence of different ideas. So that doesn't answer why Constantinople uh, the edition of Constantinople, 1740, became the definitive edition of the Zohar. But I did find a window to that answer this afternoon. And so I am going to hold that question. I'm going to ask you to remember it. And sometime much later in this talk, I'll come back to it and you'll go, Ah, oh, now I see the beauty of history. In the meantime, let's look at the world. <laughs> let's look at the world. So the world is big, much, much bigger than Europe. And let's go back to something that I mentioned in the first talk about the basic axis of Jewish communities in the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire is not Europe. And for Jews living in Europe, Basically, in the 18th century, anything that wasn't Europe was in the Ottoman Empire. You were either in the exactly you were either in the Christian world, or you were not in the Christian world. You were in the Islamic world, and if you lived somewhere in the Islamic world, we're not sure where you are, but we're sure it's somewhere in the Ottoman Empire, because the Ottoman Empire was gigantic. I mean, really really giant massive you could have you could have power struggles as we saw in the 18th century between england and france and holland and prussia and austria and russia and they're all playing che geopolitical chess but none of them would ever dream in the 18th century of taking on the ottoman empire the ottoman empire could deliver a quarter of a million men under arms at a spot like that the fact that the Ottoman Empire had lost some territories, as we discussed at the end of the 17th century, was simply because the Ottoman Empire did not consider it worthwhile to keep ploughing and investing resources in trying to keep those lands and ceded them for other purposes. But make no mistake, the Ottoman Empire is the big superpower of the time in terms of strength and size. And within the Ottoman Empire, we have an axis of Jewish communities that roughly, remember we opened the century that the largest Jewish community in the world is Salonika. By the end of the century, it's no longer Salonika. But uh, basically, here's Turkey. Smyrna is a very important, is a very important city, a very important community. Smyrna is today called Izmir. It's on the west coast of Turkey. Uh, and you have Constantinople itself. So here we have an axis. And we go as far west as Morocco. And as far east as Yemen. And you're still in the Ottoman Empire. So obviously there is a lot of interactions between these communities across this particular axis. And very, very importantly, 
in the Ottoman Empire is the land of Israel. And it's very, very instructive. And everything I'm going to talk about tonight, I want you to understand that that is all going on while everything else I've spoken about in the last three weeks is going on. It really is sometimes incredible to realise when you think to yourself, that must be all that's going on, and then you realise it's not. What was the land of Israel as we now know called then? Palestine. It was Palestine. But Palestine was not what we now call Israel. Palestine was a whole area of the Levant. So if you were in what is today Jordan, you would be in Palestine. It wasn't a country in the Ottoman Empire, it was an area. And an area for the purposes of administration. Pretty much the same way that in the ancient world, the Seleucid dynasty, and to some extent the Romans, called this whole area Syria. The Ottomans called it Palestine. Now, there had been something of a revival of Jerusalem and some of the communities in the 17th century. But by the time we get to the end of the 17th, before we hit the, just before we hit the 18th, the land of Israel, which probably has overall about 2,000 Jews living in it, it's not a huge community, but the land of Israel and Palestine undergoes something of a recession. This is due to the fact that due to the opening up of the new world and all sorts of different understandings of trade routes where European countries are simply able to sail around the whole box and dice and go to wherever they needed to get to, all of the tr famous trade routes are no longer as busy and countries whose economies depend on those trade routes go into decline. These declines are therefore felt, obviously, by Jewish communities living in those countries. Bear in mind, and what I'm about to tell you is an estimate of historians, it's not an estimate by me, but there are people that try and study populations. The population of the world in the 18th century what do you reckon? Estimates tell us, it's not a lolly jar, you don't have to guess. <laughs> Estimates are telling us around about 720 million. Okay? Mm -hmm. And they estimate that there are probably about two and a half million Jews by this point. Uh, prob that's, that number is probably more towards the end of the 18th century, as you're about to go into the 19th, the numbers I just gave you. But it gives you an idea. The country, by the time you get to the 18th century, the country with the most numbers of Jews in it, not the biggest single communities, because the two biggest communities in the Jewish world are Constantinople and Amsterdam. But the country with the biggest number of Jews is Russia, despite having had laws for a long time that have banned Jews from Russia. It actually has the biggest number of Jews, because remember, Russia has now incorporated Ukraine, Ukraine big massive parts of Poland, Belarus, Lithuania, that's all now Russian. Catherine Nagrad's got all that, and she sets up the Pale of Settlement, and she's got hundreds of thousands of Jews living on her territory. But outside, once we get to here, uh, La, you know, Constantinople, which might have 20,000 Jews, is considered an extremely large community. There's maybe 2,000 Jews in the Holy Land, and they're undergoing something of a depression. And I need to tell you that because what is about to happen at the beginning, we're going back to the beginning of the 18th now. I know we're on the fourth course, but I'm looking at the, tracking this throughout the 18th. We've got a lot to talk about. But I need you to understand what is about to happen because at the beginning of the 18th century there start to stir, there begins to stir, and I did refer to this a little bit, in Europe, this thing that happens from time to time with constant regularity in the Jewish world we don't so much sit, well actually we do see it, we do see it sometimes. I was about to say we don't see it so much sitting in Caulfield in the 21st century, but actually we do. And, <laughs> and that from time to time, uh, quite regularly, there's this thing called 
messianic yearnings. And we know that there were some significant messianic yearning movements that were popping up at the end of the 17th century and the beginning of the 18th. And most of those messianic movements that were popping up were the result of what some historians call... There are two major movements, messianic impulse movements, that we're going to look at. And the first one we're going to look at is the 1706 movement. And I'll explain in a second why it's called the 1706 movement. Because what I'm hoping I can show tonight is that, on the one hand, the land of Israel acts, and has, as it has always acted, like the heart of the Jewish world. It draws in energies and then pumps it out. Draws it in and pumps it out. And at the beginning of the 18th century, we too see two movements start to converge on the land of Israel. The 1706 movement is a movement that at its core believed that Shabtai Tzvi would return as the Messiah 40 years after his famous apostasy, after his famous conversion to Islam. And many mainstream Kabbalists were caught up in this idea. And one or two of them led significant movements of Aliyah. They decided to take themselves and entire communities to the land of Israel. Famously, in 702, in 1702, a figure called Avraham Rovigo, from Rovigo in Italy, went there with a well-resourced aliyah to establish a yeshiva, to establish an academy where he and his students would learn, study, pray and wait for the Messiah. Right? That was a classic example. And many young Italian scholars uh, who respected Avraham Rovigo uh, followed him and were partaking in that. But that wasn't a big movement, but that's a classic example of that sort of movement. It's really only later scholars that have come along and worked out that Avraham Rovigo was a Shabbatean. It wasn't something that was widely known. He was an example of a crypto Shabbatean. It wasn't something he, public, he made public. It's only because we have letters and diaries and accounts of other people that we've worked out that that's what was going on. But the really big one of the 1706 movement is one that I think you would all be familiar with. And I know that some of you are sitting there going, no, David, I'm not familiar with it. <laughs> and I'm telling you that you are. Because in the, towards the end of the 1690s, there was a groundswell movement led by a figure called Yehuda Hasid. Now, there are two famous, there are two famous Rabbi Yehuda Hasids in Jewish history. One is living in the 12th century in Spain or Germany, in Germany, and that is a medieval figure. We're talking about, that's Rabbi Yehuda ben Shmuel Hasid, but we're talking about Yehuda Hasid at the end of the 17th, beginning of the 18th century, who led what can only be described as the worst and most poorly planned aliyah that has ever taken place. Now I know that all of us have friends that have made aliyah unprepared and disorganized. Right? We all know people like that. I've been one of those people in the past several times. <laughs> but that's nothing on the scale of Yehuda Hasid. By the time he, they left Europe, he had a following of 1,500 people. Men, women, children, you know, something. We're talking about hundreds of families. 
on the way to Israel from Moravia, from Germany, from deep in the heart of Central and Eastern Europe, 500 of them died before they even got to the land of Israel. In Jerusalem at the time are living about 500 Jews under incredibly difficult circumstances. A massive economic recession was gripping the core of the Ottoman Empire and there was no money. And suddenly, in the middle of 1700, 1,000 followers of Yehuda HaChassid suddenly arrive in Jerusalem looking for subsistence. Help us find somewhere to live, right? Get us food. I mean, this devastated the community of Jerusalem. They just had, the, they were overwhelmed. They could barely feed themselves and suddenly a thousand poor, pretty uneducated, pretty superstitious Ashkenazic Jews just come up and go, oh, we're here to wait for the Messiah. <laughs> and now, one of the things, they had no money, but they thought it would be a very good idea to build a synagogue. <laughs> As you do. Just having no money hasn't stopped communities building synagogues then and later. And so they build a synagogue on borrowed funds. They borrowed it from local Druze and Arab communities. When they couldn't pay it back, that caused all sorts of unpleasantness which ended up in the 1720s with Arab hordes coming in and destroying it. And that became the Churva Synagogue in the old city. You know that one with the famous arch, right? You've all seen the pictures. You know, oh, that one, which has just been rebuilt and restored. And I was actually at the opening in, nine, in 2010 and uh, beautiful shul now, but they've rebuilt it but for a couple of, two, three centuries. For three centuries, it sat there as the Churva Synagogue. And it's right next to and on top of the synagogue of the Ramban, of Nachmanides synagogue there in the old city, in the Jewish quarter, you can see it. Of, by the way, Yehuda Hasid himself died the week they arrived. He died a few days afterwards, so they were leaderless and with no... And as a result of all that mess, the Ottoman Empire banned Ashkenazim from Jerusalem for a long, long time. Ashkenazim were banned. Remember I spoke in the first talk about the, that the split between Ashkenazic and Sephardic Jewry was still very much in force right throughout the Jewish world, particularly in Europe? Well, they imported all that to Israel. The Ottomans didn't really care at first about who was Ashkenazic, who was Sephardic, but they cared after they realized what had happened. In fact, fascinatingly, some of the Ashkenazic Jews that had come with Yehuda HaChassid, who were obstinate and wanted to stay, managed to stay by pretending to be Sephardim. And that itself had some very interesting consequences. But as things go, that wasn't the only Aliyah, nor was it the only Aliyah movement. Shabtai Tzvi, I'm here to tell you, did not return in 1706. <laughs> and that kind of dashed the hopes of the 1706 movement. And by the way, those of us who go, oh, stupid Jews, <laughs> right, oh, you know, jumping up and down every two minutes about the Messiah. Some of you who've read history of the 18th, 19th century know that millennial movements were very popular right across the Judeo-Christian world. It wasn't just Jewish communities that were coming up with this. There were many Protestant millennial movements that were arising. And in fact, many of the denominations of Christianity that are still with us today are the result of millennial movements. Judaism does not have a monopoly on it. It's just that when we do it, we do it in a particularly Meshuga type of way. But the real, and also because it represents the constant yearning and the constant relationship of the Jewish world with the land of Israel, that Israel is ultimately our home. Because the second big movement, 
which is probably much more significant, actually, was not a Sabbatean movement. It was the 1740 movement. And the 1740 movement, you won't find that. Um, you'd have to dig around a lot to find it called the 1740 movement. But it's clear that there was something going on around the year 1740 because we have so many famous aliyot and some historians have defined a kind of global Jewish movement that was happening around this time. Why do you think there would have been a global movement towards the land of Israel, towards restoring Zion, towards millennialism, towards messianic expectation around the year 1740? What is special about the year 1740? I'll ask, I'll, I'll ask this question again. 1740 or 48? 1740. I'll ask this question again because I'm thinking that maybe I wasn't fair in the way I asked it because some of you are thinking, oh, what's going on historically? But it's actually more precise than that. What's special about the year 1740? The year 1740 in the Hebrew calendar is the year 5,500. And we know, because we have a lot of ancient traditions that tell us that the world is 6,000 years long. And that every millennium represents a day. And so from 1240 onwards, began the sixth day, which is the sixth millennium of creation. Therefore, once you get to 5,500, you are in the second half of Friday, which means that you are already on the Sabbath Eve, the Sabbath being the Messianic age, mm -hmm. which means just as Jewish households can bring the Sabbath in early, and it's meritorious to do that, similarly, the Jewish people are ripe for redemption as soon as we hit that epoch. Everybody follow what I'm saying? Yep. So people going, oh, 5,000, they weren't going, oh, 1740, they were going, oh, 5,500, now's the time to go to Israel and wait for the Messiah. In a very pure, holy way. This was not a Sabbatean movement. And therefore we see several very, very important and significant aliyot. One of them we actually discussed, and I think we discussed, and I can't remember, it was I think in the first talk when I spoke about the Ramchal, Moshe Chaim Lutzato, yeah? Yes. Um, he arrived with his family in 1747, that was a little later, but we have seen, and, and I want to show you the significance of this, uh, because probably around 1740, 1741, is the aliyah to the land of Israel of the uh, probably universally regarded greatest, holiest sage of the 18th century. Now, I know that some of you are sitting there going, oh, you've mentioned so many great and holy sages, David, and last week you spoke about the Gaon of Vilna, and you've spoken about the Baal Shem Tov, and you've spoken about this, and you've spoken about that, this person really was regarded universally. There's no argument about this person. There's no one saying, oh, maybe for the Hasidim, maybe for the Mitnagdim, maybe for the Polishes, maybe for the Litvaks, maybe for the Germans, maybe for the this, maybe for the Svardi, maybe for the Ashkenazim. Everybody recognized this person. And he was living in Morocco. Who am I going to talk about? Chaim Ibn At no, Gvirol died a long time ago. First of all, it's not Chaim Ibn Gvirol. Just because you hear the word Ibn doesn't mean you suddenly got to go Gvirol, right? It's Shlomo Ibn Gvirol, and he's also living in the 11th century, right? No. This is Chaim Ibn Atar, otherwise known, otherwise known by the title of his most famous work, the Or HaChaim. And the Or HaChaim is someone who is so great 
and holy that even the Baal Shem Tov, deep, deep in the Gefilte fish line over here, living in the Boch, in Menzibo says that if he could, he would walk on foot to study with the Orachayim. When the Orachayim decided to make Aliyah from Morocco, there was almost like the entire edifice of Moroccan spirituality and Morocco was a community that had been around for centuries and centuries, had picked itself up and gone on Aliyah. This was an enormous Aliyah from the westernmost reaches of the Ottoman Empire and the Sephardic world. Make no mistake, the Orachayim's commentary is still studied today all over the world. He is a huge figure. Miracle worker, Kabbalist, great sage, uh, Talmudist, just an all-round um, wise rabbi and a holy, deeply spiritual figure. That was significant that the Orachayim made Aliyah at that time. And at almost the same time, there was an Aliyah of a unique and outstanding individual. Oh, well, before I talk about that, around about 1740, there is the Aliyah of... I, 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 each of these people could take a lecture on their own. You have to realise this. I'm just mentioning them to give you a picture of what's going on. Rabbi Chaim, don't get confused by this. Don't get confused. When I write the name, what I'm about to write on the board, some of you are going to go, ah. Oh. Don't get confused, because the person you're thinking about also been dead for six, seven hundred years, and someone else. But his name is Rabbi Chaim Abu Lafia. Not Avraham Abu Lafia of the 13th century, but Chaim Abu Lafia of the 18th century. It's very difficult five, six hundred years later to say related, but probably, probably. Remember that Abraham Abu Lafia himself had kind of disappeared. But Rukhaim Abu Lafia was the rabbi of Smyrna. And he picked himself up at the age of 80 and made Aliyah to build the community of Tiberias, which had lain in ruin for quite some time because he saw that the rebuilding of these holy communities was important for bringing about the messianic era and while Rabbi Chaim, in fact when the Ora Chaim arrived in Israel he went to visit Rabbi Chaim Abu Lafia in Tiberias he begged him to stay but the Ora Chaim wanted to set up his institution in Jerusalem he, the Ora Chaim himself only lived a year after he arrived in Jerusalem by the way all of these figures usually when you arrive in Israel you don't just run to where you want to go I actually should say this, this is important, this is important because sometimes we romanticize what's going on in the 18th century and we forget certain things. Life was really, really tough. It wasn't just tough because everybody was poor. It wasn't just tough because there was no money and there was no food and there was no, you know, little water and there was not much going on. But it was tough because there were also devastating plagues and diseases that would wipe out entire communities at random. Well, not at random, but in the way that diseases work. Plus, when you think you'd got through that, boom, you'd have an earthquake. There was an earthquake in the 1750s in the land of Israel that wiped out the community of Tzfat. So, Life was very, very tough. So when people arrived in Israel, they'd usually wait a little bit, one of the ports, like Akko or whatever, to see what the lay of the land was. They would sometimes have to wait months before they would be told it's now safe to proceed. It wasn't, you know, land at Ben Gurion Airport at nine in the evening, get a Sherut to the Hilton, relax, wake up, <laughs> go and have breakfast, sit by the pool, right? It's not that. No. It is tough. I mean, just getting there was tough, and being there was even tougher. But in the 1740s, is, as well as the Aliyah of Rebbe Chaim Abu Lafi, as well as the Aliyah of the Orachayim, oh, by the way, the Orachayim is one of only very, very few people, maybe only four or five people in the whole of Jewish history, who is granted 
the title of HaKadosh, the Holy One. There's very few people that have that title. And then at the same time, you have the Aliyah of a huge figure from Yemen to Jerusalem called Rabbi Shalom Sharabi. I know I'm throwing a lot of names at you. Rabbi Shalom Sharabi arrives as a young man in his 20s from Yemen and he immediately makes his way to the Kabbalistic Yeshiva. There is a Kabbalistic Academy in Jerusalem that has been set up in the 1730s because of the spread of Kabbalah was everywhere and people who were mystically inclined wanted to come along but it wasn't a yeshiva you could just join easily you had to be initiated into the mysteries of Kabbalah you had to be very very proficient at the knowledge and the texts and uh, the rabbis of the Beit El Academy the Beit El Yeshiva which is still there in the old city were very very uh, guarded themselves very, very significantly against all manner of uh, uh, spiritual and physical incursions. But Rav Shalom Sharabi was a complete unknown and got himself a job as the caretaker with no one knowing exactly who he was or what he knew and what he didn't know. And uh, so quickly did he impress people that he soon became the head of the academy. As soon as they realized... He started participating in the discussions and once again they realized that he had this absolutely phenomenal uh, they regarded him in fact as a re I've seen your hand they regarded him as a reincarnation of Isaac Luria that's how big he was and he revolutionized I'm going to deal with it in one second he revolutionized the study of Kabbalah when you go to Jerusalem today and you want to study in a serious Kabbalistic yeshiva as some people do I'm not talking about your lolly water red string type thing. I'm talking about hardcore, proper, core of the Jewish world, textual, spiritual uh, yeshivot that focus on Kabbalah. Most of those schools today are forms of the methodology and spiritual techniques developed by Rav Shalom Sharabi, who more than anybody else, is responsible for developing this idea called kavanot, which are the special mystical uh, meditations that accompany prayer. If you go to Caulfield Shul today for mincha, for the afternoon prayer, it will take 10 minutes, and so it should. But if you go to one of these yeshivot, mincha with tefillin can take anywhere up to an hour and a half the closest analogue to it in the non-Jewish world would be Tibetan monks. And they spend years mastering. And what's interesting is the parallel is that while that's happening, the Baal Shem Tov is running around Europe saying, ah, oh, prayer is as important as study, and does a whole focus on prayer, but with a completely different approach. He just, the Baal Shem Tov just wants you to raise yourself in ecstatic states of joy at the simple meaning of the words and the connection with God, whereas... Rav Shalom Sharabi was going deep into the mysticism behind every letter, behind every word, concentrated meditation. Can you see that kind of difference? But this did revolutionise, to many, much extent, the world of Kabbalah. Yeah. Just wondering, um, institutions in Israel, were they being supported from, uh, from good clarets as well? I'm going to sit here and you're going to give the talk because that's exactly what I was going to talk about perfect, thank you and that is totally well timed I mean, I wasn't making fun of you it's actually a very, very good that means you're following and you know exactly what I'm going to talk about because remember I spoke about the fact that Israel is the heart so you get energies pumping in but you get energies pumping out and we're going to look at exactly that question because what you've asked is really this and just before I deal with that, just let me sum up what I just spoke about. So we've got several major aliyot. We've got other aliyot by very significant figures that are tragically and unfortunately I don't have time to talk about today, but would really, really like to. In fact, I will for one minute. I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about a very significant figure who's coming from Italy. Rabbi Emmanuel. Just for a minute I'm going to talk about this figure. Chai Riki. Now, Rabbi Emanuel Chayriki uh, grows up in Italy, in Ferrara and so on, in an Italy where he is 
quite influenced by the work of Avraham Rovigo, though um, Emmanuel Chayriki is not really a, Kab a Shabbatin in that sense. He's much more pure Kabbalist. But uh, eventually he makes his way to the land of Israel. But what's interesting about, several things are interesting about Emmanuel Chayriki is that he spends almost his entire life traveling in these kind of literary voyages of discovery around the Jewish world. And he, in fact, ends up in, at one stage in Livorno, uh, where uh, the, uh, there are a lot of wealthy businessmen who have amazing libraries, but they don't understand what's written in them. So they commission him to sit down and write a summary of all these Kabbalistic books. And his summaries then become key texts in Europe throughout the 18th century that are commented on and studied by everybody, Hasidim and non-Hasidim and so on. So it's a very, very important figure, his uh, famous book, Mishnat Hasidim. But he ends up in Jerusalem and then... After a few years in Jerusalem, he goes back in search of uh, to sell some of his works in order to uh, sustain himself further. further. And I'm, uh, I'm mentioning this because, uh, just to give you an indication about how difficult life in the 18th century is, is that even someone as great as uh, Rabbi Emanuel Chayriki was not immune to the dangers of travelling. And in fact, he was uh, captured by pirates uh, who killed him and uh, in fact strangled him with his own tefillin and left him for dead, in fact left him dead, uh, for a, a six days or a week until the Jewish community uh, found him. A uh, famous uh, story because when they brought his body in for burial, uh, despite having lain ex completely exposed for a week, it hadn't actually started decomposing at all. And it, well, not sure, but, but uh, that's not the main thing about it. The main thing about Roberto Chayrecki is, he's an amazing Kabbalist, and he wrote books that were studied right across uh, the Jewish world. But he makes Aliyah as well. So we've got all these great figures making Aliyah and living in Jerusalem. And yet you've got to ask yourself, I'm just having a look at the time. Oh, okay, okay. We'll just start this, and then we'll take a break. But then you've got to ask yourself, okay, well, it was tough, right? And then it got tougher. And then it got even tougher still. But how did they survive? You don't just survive by saying it's tough. You actually have to survive somehow. How do you survive? So what had developed in the land of Israel, Schnorring's a very harsh term. What had developed in the land of Israel, what has developed in the land of Israel by this point is a very, very important institution in the Jewish world that some of you will be familiar with, all of you will be familiar with in some form, called the Chalukah system. The word Chalukah in Hebrew literally means distribution. And what it was, was that communities all around the Jewish world would contribute to the upkeep of Jewish life in the land of Israel. Now you can say it's snoring, you can say it's this, you can say it's that, but it's no different from today Remember that the Chalukah system of the 18th century was the forerunner of the Jewish agency. And even as something as innocuous as your blue box is in fact a direct product of the Chalukah system as it was worked out in the 18th century. And in order to get these funds, the communities of Israel would have to send representatives to communities all around the Jewish world. And this represents one of the most fascinating unwritten stories, was well, partly written in different places, but not really connected, of the whole of Jewish history. Because they developed this institution of the Shadar, the Shaliach de Rabbanan, the representative, the Meshulach, that was sent out from the land of Israel by the rabbis of the land of Israel with documents, with approbations, with letters, with requests, 
and they would go to Jewish communities where they could find them to gather and collect funds which they would take back to Israel so that the communities in Jerusalem and the other holy cities in Israel could survive. The general agreement, though it varied at different times, the general agreement was that the Meshulach could keep 45% of his collections and 10% of anything collected from the area that he had covered for the, if it was a new area, for the next seven years. Everybody follow? Yeah. Who hasn't at some point had a knock on the door at, say, eight in the evening, and you open it up, open the door, and there's a guy standing there. He looks like he just walked out of the 18th century, <laughs> right? It's happened to all of us. That was happening two, three hundred years ago, right around the Jewish world, except that... <laughs> These people were not just random. The official delegates sent by the Jewish community to, to far-flung places were of the highest caliber. If you come with a letter of approbation with seven or eight signatures of the rabbis of Jerusalem, it means that they had officially got behind you. Some of these, some of these were walking around with some very, very significant documentations and they would travel all over Europe and all over the Ottoman Empire gathering funds and that would be brought to a central committee in the land of Israel and that would be distributed. Now it wasn't simple always to give funds. If you were in the Ottoman Empire that's not a problem to give funds for Jewish communities in the Holy Land because the Holy Land is inside the Ottoman Empire. So you're shipping money from one part of the Ottoman Empire to the other. But if you're in Europe and you're sending money to the Ottoman Empire, you can be perceived as assisting enemies of the state, which is precisely the accusation made against Shneer Zalman of Liadi, the great Hasidic leader, the first Rebbe of Chabad, who was imprisoned and released on the 19th of Kislev, which was today, in 1798, which was a whole big festival for the Hasidim. But that was basically the accusation that they were brought against him, is that he was supporting communities in the land of Israel, which was seen by the Russian authorities. Well, why would you be sending money to the Ottoman Empire? So it wasn't... And, and, and when I said that, you know, these guys could keep 45% of their collections, right? That might sound to some of you, ah, oh, what a rort, right? But you have to realise, these men were away. First of all, travel was tough. And these men were away from their homes and their families, sometimes for seven to eight years at a time. It wasn't, ah, oh, I'm just flying from Tullamarine to Hong Kong and then I'll get on the LL and I'll land in Tel Aviv and I'll be there, I'll be staying at the La Rome and I'll come back next Friday, right? They were away for years. It was a very, very difficult time. Now, after the break, I'm going to talk about some of the phenomenal places that they got to that transformed the Jewish world, which is this untold story of the Shadars that went around having absorbed the spiritual energy and then thrusting it out. But just before the break, I'm going to tell you, because it might, might take two, three minutes, but it would probably not have time after the break to discuss this person and the other things I want to talk about. Who would be familiar, is anyone familiar with any of the famous Shadars of the 18th century? When you are sitting at that dinner party uh, and the rabbinic representatives of the land of Israel collecting funds in the 18th century comes up as a topic, <laughs> the one person that you will need to know if you know no one else, the one person that you will want to know is because this individual... When I said at the very beginning of this course that the 18th century was packed with phenomenal individuals, this person would be in the top five and his name, some of you, when I write it on the board, you will have heard of it. Chaim. Yosef. David. Azulai. 
otherwise known by his acronym, the Chida. The Chida. He is known in Jewish history. When you're at the dinner party, don't say, oh, Rabbi Yosef Chaim, Chaim Yosef Tafa does what? Say, the Chida. And people go, oh, the Chida. <laughs> now, the Chida, interestingly enough, the Chida's mother, thank you, the Chida's father was uh, a descendant of the famous Azulai family that had come from Spain several centuries earlier as a result of the Inquisition and so on. His mother happened to be a daughter of uh, an Ashkenazic rabbi called Yosef Biala, who had come out with Yehuda HaChassid and had stayed in Jerusalem by basically pretending to be a Sephardi and marrying his daughter off to a Sephardi family. But the Chida grew up, was a genius, of course, uh, educated when he was already a teenager. He found that the Or Chaim had made Aliyah, and so he learned, studied under the Or Chaim, studied under others, and then when he was already in his 20s, he was so significantly impressive, not just as a student and a scholar, but as an individual. He was, everybody that saw him says this, and, and there's real proof of this, is that he had this remarkable stature. He was tall, he was amazing looking, very, very finely presented, very eloquent, just a pleasant conversationalist, but a brilliant man, could speak several languages, was immensely scholarly, and just the sort of person you would want to send to communities. And he had, um, thankfully for us in Jewish history and for the Jewish world, his most remarkable contributions were the fact that he had an astonishing thirst for manuscripts and obscure books. So wherever he went around the Jewish world, and he went, as, he went everywhere in this picture. He went to uh, North Africa, he was, in, he was in Eastern Europe, Central Europe, he went as far as London, he was in Amsterdam, he was everywhere. And the first thing he would say was, show me your book, show me your book, show me. So much of our knowledge of history and much of our knowledge of the whole study of bibliography is due to the work of the Chida. Even your 19th century Chazafresses who came along as part of the Wissenschaft des Judentums group who were trying to set up the you know, secular study of Jewish studies and Jewish academia relied heavily on the work, the 18th century work, done by the Chida in his famous work Shem HaGdolim, in which he compiled lists of uh, uh, biographies and bibliographies that were just uh, the, the foundations of the science of Jewish history, basically. He was an unbelievably integral individual. One of those people that it's difficult to imagine. He got to a town once. The most famous story about him is that he got to a town once and he had lost his documentation. He also has extensive diaries, which were as it's made, but he lost his documentation. So he went to the local leaders and he said, look, I don't have my documents with me, but I'm the Chida. And you basically, and they said, oh, yeah, right, you're the Chida. Right? How do we know you're the Chida? I mean, you could, you know, anyone could be the Chida. The Chida would have documents. And he goes, no, I, I, then they said, you know what? We've got some of your books. We've got some of your books that you've written. So why don't you tell us what's in the books you tell us what's in the books, your innovations on Torah, and we'll believe you that you're the Chida. He refused. He refused to benefit from his Torah. So he sat there for weeks and weeks until new documentation could be brought. Do you understand? He, he refused to actually get mercurial benefit of any form from his own innovations, even though they were his. And the, famous, the other famous thing, because it's mentioned not only by the Chida himself, but by other people, um, remarkable, just to give you an idea, and those of you who are interested in interesting figures of the 18th century, I haven't got time to go into depth, but the Chida is worth looking at, uh, Azula is worth looking at, because in around seven, in the early 1780s, he was in France. And he got to Paris and then he was taken, because he was so interested in everything, a very intellectually curious person, uh, he was uh, taken to Versailles, and Louis the Sixteenth was sitting there 
in his throne room and saw out the window that there was a small party of oriental looking gentlemen who were wandering around the gardens and he saw the chida and he said, who is that? I've never seen anyone looking so impressive and interesting. Seriously, he impressed. He, in other words, he was even impressive to Louis the Sixteenth, and so Louis the Sixteenth had uh, the Chida brought before him, uh, at, in order just to have an audience, just to meet who this gentleman was, and said, uh, "Where are you, an ambassador from?" Right? And he said, "Well, I'm just." He didn't. The Chida didn't want to go into great detail about what he was doing, so um, the others around him just said, "Ah." Oh, He's just a tourist from Cairo, right? <laughs> and uh, he's, he's not here for anything other than the fact that he's curious, right? And uh, Louis XVI had a little chat with him and off he went. But just to show you the lives of some of these uh, representatives that were going around the Jewish world. I mean, the, the, even the Chida was away for, like I said, seven, eight years at a time. Um, he would, uh, uh, in, in, in fact, in, in one place he was in Italy where... He received news that his wife had passed away in Jerusalem uh, and he didn't tell anyone because he didn't want to put the community to any kind of trouble or discomfort for him. Uh, after the break, uh, we're going to talk about some of the more remarkable uh, outcomings of that. I wanted to get to at least the Chida so we would know where we were uh, in relation to this. But um, I'll see you in about... We do have a lot of interesting material I want to discuss. So um, I'll see you in about 10 minutes. All right. Just a couple of notes of that because someone wanted me to clarify. Uh, the Chida, uh, Zula was actually born in Israel. So he's a classic in Jerusalem. So he's a classic example of someone who was inspired by the people that came to Jerusalem and then was one of those whose energy then poured out uh, in his circulations. And also, uh, just to clarify, it wasn't like they were schlepping the guilt, Right. There was a whole system in the 18th century of how you could transfer credit and money on promissory notes that would be good to be cashed at different places, at different kind of nexus places across the world. That was one of the things, in fact, when I mentioned uh, last week about the Rothschilds, was one of the things that they were able to revolutionise was the way that private mercantile banking was done. But there were, even before then, certain places. If you could, for example, manage to get a letter of the right credentials to a certain account that you had with the bank in Venice, that would be good to cash out for a thing, then you would go on to the next part and so on. That's how money was transferred. Very quickly. I just have a sure. The, popula the Jewish population in the 18th century mentioned about two million. Two and a half million, yeah, yeah. You've two million. You've listed so many super geniuses in that period. Yes. And, and I haven't even, I was just scratching the surface. As a proportion, yeah, yes. it appears they're much higher than, for example, in today's time. That, is, that has been noted and observed. Uh, may have some, probably to do with the fact that intellectualism was hothoused, so uh, intellectual talent was recognised early on and then the conditions were created to um, develop it. Uh, much less distraction than today. Extraordinary ratio. Extraordinary ratio. Extraordinary ratio. Uh, it's not the only time in history that we've had that extraordinary ratio. and I, uh, the, the, This is not... Uh, I don't want to get distracted because we could easily get distracted, but you would be aware that uh, in the 1920s, right, two-thirds of all academic positions in Germany were held by Jews. <coughs> That's one of the things that was driving the Nazis nuts, right? I mean, the immense outpouring once emancipation arrived in the 19th century of Jews who could use that latent talent and uh, burst out onto the intellectual scene. But the 18th century is unique. I've always referred to the 18th century as like an uber-flowering of the Jewish mind. And not just intellectually. There were great spiritual figures, and we've looked at some of those. It was, it was transformative, really, it was. That's a good observation, but no one really understands why that is. That just was a phase of what happened. It's a whole series of circumstances. But I want to I talk about um, this aspect of the, of the delegates of the Shadar these shluchim that were going out from the land of Israel. And some of them went to remarkable places in the world, if you think where they travelled, from Jerusalem, from Hebron, from Tzfat, from the Holy Land, where they were sent out to, not just to collect funds. Their mission was not just to collect funds, but in many ways to guide and contribute to the communities that they found. 
Some of the places that they found were very, very remote Jewish communities that were struggling to not just to hold on to their own identity as Jewish communities, but deal with the basic day-to-day -day facts of Jewish life. How do we do this? We don't have any rabbis, we don't have any sages. So these rabbis that came from Israel, from the core of the Jewish world, great sages, not just any, you know, Wheaties packet rabbi, but some of these big, you know, rabbis were in fact uh, amazing in the way they transformed communities. I mean, but they went far. You know, in the 18th century, we already had a sizable Jewish community, and I'm saying several thousand in India. So, not, and I'm not just talking now about the uh, pop Jewish populations that have been there for a long time, such as the uh, Bnei Israel and the Paradesi and all the other amazingly interesting Indian. But there was now actually even kind of like a, a Sephardic established community in India. Because at the end of the day, and here's something I want to bring us back to, and I said this in the first talk, and I want to bring us back to it, to a realisation, is that in the 18th century, if you were cultured and civilised and wealthy and Jewish, chances are you were Sephardic, not Ashkenazic. There were a few wealthy Ashkenazic Jews before Rothschild, who's at the end of the 18th, a few wealthy, but they were really only wealthy in terms of their own communities. They weren't mind-bogglingly wealthy or internationally wealthy on the scale of many, many Sephardic businessmen who had access to trade routes <coughs> right throughout the Ottoman Empire, which was much, much bigger. And of course, once you're into the Ottoman Empire, and once you can stretch as far as India, then you've got China as well, and we had Jewish communities in China. So even, and so what you wanted, but yet in the 18th century, the world is changing. And the Ottoman Empire doesn't really have access now to the really interesting things that are going on. If there's one place the Ottoman Empire is not reaching, it's the new world. And what you want, therefore, when you travel throughout Christian countries, Europe, or countries or parts of the world controlled by Europe, you want to find, ultimately, Sephardim who are living in Europe or in countries controlled by Europe. That's really where you're going to go if you want to try and tap in the wealth. If you're not going to go to a boch in the Ukraine and ask for, you know, groschen. You're going to go to Sephardim living in Amsterdam and London who are deeply established business people with tremendous trade networks and probably fantastic furniture and libraries, right, and good food. I'm not saying good food was their motive, but it doesn't hurt, you know. Like, you know. Now, and remember, as I have famously said, as I have famously said, and I'll say it again, some of you may have heard me make this comment before, but you know that famous statement of the sages in the Talmud where they said, ten measures of beauty came into the world and nine of them were taken by Jerusalem. There is an equal statement that could be made that 10 measures of cuisine came into the Jewish world and the Sephardic world took nine of them. <laughs> All of your stodgy Ashkenazic food, your cholent, your kreplach, knedlach, your filter fish, your kishka, all the rest of it. Interesting, I love that stuff, but it doesn't really come anywhere near for taste uh, what the Sephardic world with all these amazing cuisines and tastes were and still are capable of offering. But I want to talk now, really, I want to move on, and I want to talk about this, uh, the idea of the Shadar and just how far they got. Because in 1759, and this is really kind of a shtickle turning point, uh, in 1759, a Shaliach from the Holy Land called Rabbi Moses Malchi Rabbi Moses Malchi turns up after traveling for a long time from the land of Israel turns up in 1759 in Newport, Rhode Island. He is the first rabbi to arrive in North America. <laughs> 
What do you think was the largest community in North America? Newport, no, it wasn't. No, it yes. no New York wasn't. Virginia. It was, in fact. No, 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 no. No, I'm, I was curious. No, in other words, if we were in America, if we were an American audience, this is like, this is stuff they know. I'm going to. Philadelphia. No, Philadelphia. <laughs> so, so, so. Uh, the Touro Synagogue in Newport is still the oldest standing synagogue. Sherit Israel in New York is the oldest congregation. Mikveh Israel Synagogue in Philadelphia, where I've been, some of who's been to there? Has anyone been there? Yeah. So you've been there, I've been there as well. So that's a very old. They're all within a few decades of each other in the 18th century. But the largest Jewish community at the time, for much of the later half of the 18th century in North America, was Charleston, South Carolina. And we'll come back to that in a second. In fact, that would have been the largest community on the mainland of what's going to become the United States. But it's not actually the largest community in North America. The largest community in North America is, in fact, in the West Indies, in places like Curacao and Suriname. Why? Because Jews were quite heavily involved in a lot of the sugar plantations and slave trade that was going on at the time and therefore communities had built up around that but there were growing communities in what was going to become the United States and of course it wasn't the United States at the time but in 1759 Moshe Malchi turns up and it was a big deal a rabbi from the Holy Land it wasn't just Jews who came to the synagogue to hear him deliver a sermon but the governor came and several other non-Jewish dignitaries came and he delivered this sermon in Ladino. And they sat and they listened and didn't understand a word, but were very impressed. Now, one of the people, one of the people that was in the audience, because he was fascinated by Jews, was a very interesting Gentile by the name of... Ezra Stiles. And Ezra Stiles was a clergyman and uh, fancied himself as a bit of a theologian and had spent quite some time trying to learn Hebrew and was fascinated by Jews. So he actually kept a calendar of when important Jewish festivals were or important Jewish events and would run down the synagogue and sit there and listen and watch and observe and his diaries are an amazing source of description about what was going on uh, inside the synagogues in the 18th century. Obviously, obviously, uh, the congregation in Newport, Rhode Island, Sherit Israel in New York, McVeigh Israel in Philadelphia, all of these communities were Sephardic. Jews, Jews first came to North America about 100 years before that. They were, in fact, escaping the Inquisition yeah. because at the time... Uh, when Brazil was handed back by the Dutch to the Portuguese, there was a tremendous concern that the Inquisition would then be applied to everywhere in the Americas. So they escaped basically to North America. But at the beginning of the 18th century, there's less than 500 Jews in, you, in America. We're not talking big numbers, maybe even less than 300. By the end of the 18th, it's several thousand. But communities are small, but they're very strong communities. And they're very traditional communities. And so Moshe Malchi spent some time in Newport, Rhode Island, and he impressed Ezra Stiles. And Ezra Stiles writes in his diaries over the course of about 15, 20 years that he met six or seven of these great rabbis that came from Israel. But the one that really blew him away the most was, in fact, Rabbi Chaim Yitzchak, although he added the name Raphael towards the end of his life. Raphael Chaim Yitzchak Karigal, sometimes spelled with a K. And Karigal was probably the most serious uh, and impressive of the rabbis that came from Israel. He also ended up in around 1773. He turned up in Newport, Rhode Island and stayed for quite some time. During that time, Ezra Stiles studied Hebrew with him and studied esoteric Jewish subjects with him until Ezra Stiles became fluent in Hebrew. Ezra Stiles then went on to become the president of Yale. 
He then instituted that the graduating address of the students of Yale every year would be in Hebrew. <laughs> As you are aware, some of you might be aware, what is the motto of Yale? Oh, it's Urim Vatumim, which interestingly enough is not due to styles, it had been Urim Vatumim before, and Urim Vatumim written in Hebrew characters. That's um, very good. Uh, it also has a Latin um, motto, which is Lux et Veritas. Yeah. Light and Truth, which is a rough translation of Urim Vatumim. You know, the Urim Vatumim was the name given to the appliance that was worn by the high priest, a jewel-crested jewel breastplate by which the different jewels would light up and you would be able to get answers to your questions. And this, in fact, was called the Urim Vatumim, and that became the motto of Yah. But Stiles was very interested in Hebrew. And Hebrew also was introduced uh, at some times as a mandatory subject at Harvard, and became a very, very important part of the American kind of spiritual landscape. So much so, and I kid you not, and you can look this up, this is fascinating, as you know, is that when they fought the War of Independence, the famous American Revolution, some of you may have heard of, and they fought the War of Independence, and they came and they broke away from the crown, and they sat down to decide a number of things about this new country called the United States of America. And one of them is, what should our language be? We're making a break from England. Maybe we should make a break from English. And there were several people, styles among them, who were arguing that the language of this new country should be Hebrew. <laughs> that, in the end, was voted down but we, it came very close to being a fact of the United States that they would have had Hebrew as their vernacular language. It's a fascinating story. So some of the... Now, what is interesting, and then you'll go, oh, yes, yes, now I understand what he was saying, right? So this afternoon, I'm reading Stiles' diaries because I found a way in which I could... There's a brilliant article written by Marcus Jastrow at the beginning of the 20th century where he'd gone through Stiles' diaries and basically culled all the interesting bits about his conversations with the rabbis. And I thought, well, that's right on what I want to think about right now. So I went... I hadn't actually read massive excerpts of Stiles' diary before. And at one of those points, Stiles said that he went to the rabbi's lodgings one afternoon to study Zohar with them. And Stiles took his own copy of the Zohar. I have no idea what copy of the Zohar Stiles had, but he must have got hold of something. And he went there to compare it with the rabbis. And the rabbi had a magnificent edition, says Stiles, in three volumes published in 1740 in Constantinople. <laughs> which immediately made me realise that one of the main reasons why the 1740 edition of the Zohar from Constantinople became so significant is because that was the edition that was being carried by these rabbinic representatives from the Holy Land, from the Ottoman Empire, who were going all around the Jewish world. So I don't, it's not a complete answer to that question, but it's starting to open a window on that possibility. Uh, by the way, since we are in the Americas, let's just deal quickly with some of those issues because at the end of the day, uh, America is growing as a place and it's growing, its Jewish community is growing and becoming its own unique thing and there are some amazing contributions made by Jews to the war effort and to the creation of the United States itself. I'm sure you're aware of that. Anyone uh, familiar with two or three of the most famous figures in that? Absolutely. Very good. Probably, as this lady will tell you, if you're at a dinner party and that comes up, you'd have to know about Chaim Solomon. You'd probably also have to know about Francis Salvador. Uh, Francis Salvador uh, was a Jewish, Sephardi Jewish businessman that had uh, um, gone to uh, live in... Um, uh, gone to live in the Americas uh, and pretty much soon after he arrived as a young man he became very involved in the whole patriotic causes. He was in fact the first Jew ever elected 
to a political position, to a public position. He was elected as a member of the legislature for South Carolina. Uh, this is before the war. In fact, he may well be the first Jew elected to an elected position anywhere in the world. Uh, he was elected as, and he was also the first Jew to die in the revolution. But he wasn't killed by the British. He was scalped by the Cherokee, who were working with the British at the time. It's an awful, gruesome story. But he is a fascinating figure. Also, Jews were very instrumental in opening up the whole new state and development of Georgia and so on. And a lot of those southern states were very, very uh, dependent on Jewish involvement and Jewish contributions as they moved from one to another. Of course, many Jews left New York when the uh, British occupied it and then had to come back after the American Revolutionary War and so on. And the other one, of course, is say Chaim Solomon. I mean, people say Chaim Solomon um, was a... Uh, uh, he, he, I mean, he was a, uh, he was a businessman. He was a businessman, but he uh, specialised in uh, his amazing ability. I mean, it's a complex story, so I don't have time to go into it now. But he it was amazing in his ability to supply uh, the American revolutionary forces with credit and with money, and spent his entire life fortunes funding the revolution. It's probably the single uh, biggest individual private contributor. In fact, on the eve of the Battle of, of Yorktown, which, as you know, is the famous last battle of the American Revolutionary War, the one that basically caused the British uh, to, uh, to surrender the, the, the whole of the Ameri North America, not Canada, but the United States, um, it, Washington writes, you know, that uh, they, they need this one more push one more push but we have no money left we have nothing we can't get food for the army we can't get them arms we can't do anything and at the very very last minute uh Chaim Salomon managed to secure there's different opinions on this but it's something was something like two hundred thousand dollars that they were able now think two hundred thousand dollars in 1776 uh, what's what's that going to be that's just an inestimable amount of money that he got and he died in poverty. He died in poverty. They just couldn't pay him back, and he died. In fact, um, famously, his descendants in the 20th century tried to reclaim the funds that their great-great-great-grandfather had lent the revolution, but that was not successful. It was regarded as a bit of a chutzpah. Uh, Washington, Washington himself visited the Touro Synagogue in Newport, Rhode Island, just as you can today if you go to Newport, Rhode Island. It's the oldest standing synagogue in the United States. He gave a speech. He sent a letter there, a very famous letter, um, to bigotry, no sanction, that famous uh, phrase of Washington's. And America became the first country in the world to grant Jews equal rights with all other human beings from ground zero, from the very, very beginning. Jews were equal in America. Not completely. Well, they were equal, f no, well, without getting into complications about it, they were equal federally, uh, but there were a couple of states like Maryland and North Carolina which held out until the 19th century before they would agree to grant Jews equal rights. That's similar to what's going on back in Europe because we can't ignore the fact that there's this thing in 1789 called the French Revolution. I'm just making sure we're okay for time. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's all right. Because the French Revolution, you know, I mean, we all studied it at school or afterwards or whatever. We read the French Revolution. It's a complex topic. And really this whole, uh, this whole movement that came out of the Enlightenment and had been pressing forward for the 18th century, for, and yet uh, the French government was still not realising <coughs> the force and the power of this, of this populist move towards uh, democracy, towards the ideals of the Enlightened in some way to give uh, citizens power, and was still trying to be monarchical right until the end, which really effectively cost... Uh, Louis the Sixteenth and Marie Antoinette their lives, and then the French Revolution. But even right throughout all that, you know, there's famous debates are going on about 
are we going to give everyone equal? Yes, we're going to give everyone equal rights. Equality is for everybody. Well, yes, you're absolutely right. The, but that is the 18th century. They saw themselves as enlightened. Having a slave, you know, even someone as enlightened as Ezra Stiles, who was like a, a picture of the Enlightenment in North America, well, he, he sent... Um, he, there was one voyage where, you know, you could make investments in voyages, right? So you could say... Uh, take this and then bring me back something interesting, right, when you go to Africa. So he goes, he gives them a big thing of rum and they bring him back a 10-year-old boy as a slave who Styles calls Newport. <laughs> and Newport grows up with Styles. I mean, we don't even understand. Like, but Jews had slaves. In the Jews had slaves. Yeah, Jews were yeah, slave yeah. owners. Yeah. Jews were slave owners. Jews had... Of the 600 or so plantations sugar plantations in the West Indies, about 50 of them were owned by Jews. Only for seven years or something, isn't there? Only that uh, yes, they were given, yes, very, very good. They were given oh, yeah, limitations sure. on that, yes. very much so. But anyway, I, I'm just going back to the French Revolution and, and, you know, the famous question like, well, what about the Jews? You know, the Jewish question was a big discussion in the debates leading up to the French Revolution. And eventually, you know, uh, uh, okay. Even the Jews. However, as the famous statement goes, right? To them as a nation, nothing. But to them as individuals, everything. In other words, you weren't to be a French Jew anymore. You were to be a Jewish Frenchman. And that being French was your first and primary identity. You were a citizen of the Republic of France, and your Jewishness was your own affair. We weren't going to stop you doing it, but it really, we'd rather you didn't. <laughs> We're just seeing you on your way to secularity a la la Révolution. And, of course, then you've got the total bastard child of the Enlightenment, Napoleon. And you have to realise that when Napoleon comes along, and really, 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 Napoleon is a 19th century story. I'm not going to get into that in detail now. But when Napoleon is stomping all over Europe and the Middle East being Napoleon, and basically, you know, concrete dropping Enlightenment ideals wherever he goes, and effectively creating this thing called the nation-state, the views in the Jewish world on Napoleon were very, very complex and very mixed. Many Jews saw Napoleon as a harbinger of enlightenment. Some even said the Jews in the land of Israel, for example, which Napoleon tried to conquer when he conquered Egypt and he wanted to make a move into Israel, they welcomed him and said, you are a sign of the Messiah. But in other places, especially in Eastern Europe, rabbis were freaking out and fighting and urging Jews to join the fight, join the Russian army, join, do whatever you have to do to fight against Napoleon. Shnir Zalman of Liadi dies running from Napoleon. And so there was this very, very mixed view. Why would they be against Napoleon? If Napoleon is bringing equal rights for all human beings, wherever he goes, why are rabbis so against Napoleon? Secularism. Secularism. Napoleon is secularism on crack. It is, that is your identity is as a citizen of your state. And to you, you as individuals, everything. But to you as a nation... Nothing. There's no such thing as the Jewish nation. What are you talking about? And those ideals of secularity started to seep in. So the very, very important shifts are happening in the 18th century. And then, and I can't not talk about this. I can't not talk about this. But some of you might know what happened towards the end of the 18th century. And that is that in 1770, Captain Cook <laughs> discovered New Holland, Terra Australis, right? 
and then 18 years later, out came the first fleet. Well, 14 is probably many, I think more like six. But, but it's interesting because whereas, as I just said, you know, America, the United States is the first country that had, where Jews had equal rights from the beginning of their political structure, but Jews, I mean, Australia was the only place to have had Jews from the very, very beginning of European settlement. Obviously, there weren't many Jews prior to that. <laughs> but we don't, we don't know. We don't know. <laughs> because, you know. But um, Jews, there were Jews on the First Fleet, and everybody had equal rights on the First Fleet because <laughs> everybody was a convict. You were either a convict or a soldier, and that was it. You were sent out here to construct this penal colony. Uh, just to see, before I talk briefly about it, who is the most famous Jewish convict from the First Fleet. In fact, probably the most famous convict of the First Fleet, but certainly the most famous. <laughs> very good, very good, very good. Esther Abrahams. I don't need to talk about Esther Abrahams if you already know all about Esther Abrahams. Put up your hand if you know who Esther Abrahams is. Put up your hand if you've got no idea who Esther Abrahams is. Okay, well, there's a few. And even, even those of you who know, it's worth going over again because she is such a remarkable figure. Ama uh, the word amazing is the word. Because here's a girl who is a teenager, is caught on the streets of London, and I've got to tell you, life wasn't pretty on the streets of London. And we know a lot about this. We know a lot about what life was like for Jews on the streets of London at the end of the 18th century. Remember, I spoke about this earlier. Waves and waves of immigration, but no natural way to progress in society left thousands of Jews fending for themselves on the streets. Huge crime rates and so on. So we don't know what, exactly what Esther's story was in London, but she was apprehended for stealing some lace and she was sent to the First Fleet. And during the course of that journey... Oh, by the way, she's got a child. Mm -hmm. She's got a child. Yes, she has a child. And the child is just a baby. It's like an infant. It's like one-year-old, uh, Rosanna. And uh, Esther is uh, 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 probably 16 or 17 years old on this ship with this child, who she had in prison, by the way, in Newgate Jail while waiting for the, to go on the first fleet. You couldn't imagine anyone more vulnerable. And she forms a protective friendship with George Johnston. George Johnston, we could do a lecture on how interesting George Johnston is, even up to the point where he meets Esther Abrams. George Johnston is an interesting figure. He'd fought in the Ameri war against American independence. He'd fought here, he'd fought there. He was made an officer when he was 11, after he saw his father die at the Battle of the Bulge. Fascinating figure, but already still a young man in his mid to late 20s, but he was already uh, sufficiently uh, not really um, medically fit yet to send out to another war. So he uh, put up his hand to go out on the First Fleet and to form part of what was going to become uh, the New South Wales Marine Corps that was going to establish uh, the penal colony. And uh, he, at the time he was a lieutenant, and he and Esther formed this relationship uh, on the way out. This, um, actually, do you know what? You have to, I have to be very, very careful. I seriously could stand here for an hour and talk about Esther Abraham. She's amazing. Do you know that on that voyage, on that voyage... They, it wasn't like, you know, in the 19th century, they got that voyage down to under three months, right? But it wasn't like that at the end of the 18th century. It took the better part of a year. They went via Rio de Janeiro, then they went around the Cape of Good Hope, they got the trade winds to land up somewhere near Australia, the whole thing. As they went around the Cape of Good Hope, Johnston got off the boat and went and bought a goat so that it could provide, apparently, Esther was having problem getting enough milk for her baby, so he got a goat. I mean, it was bizarre stories. So, that, so they arrive, and then after a while, they start living together. 
It's like his common law man and wife, which scandalised a few of the other officers and so on. And I know that um, later on, some of the governors, you know, King and Macquarie would have been, you know. But <clears throat> they had kids together. They didn't get married, right? And he didn't go back. He didn't go back to England at the end of his term of service because he stayed in this little kind of house slash settlement thing that he'd built with, with Esther. And they were there for the next, uh, well, certainly the next critical point would have been about 18 years later when we moved to 1806, actually to 1808. So it's about 20 years later when we find what happened in 1808. Absolutely. The Rum Rebellion. Those of you who didn't grow up in Australia, uh, there was this thing called the Rum Rebellion. And it was a military coup. It was the only successful military coup in Australia's history. They kicked out the governor, Governor Bly, and they replaced it with a military junta. At the head of that junta was George Johnston who by now was the senior officer of the New South Wales Marine Corps. He became effectively governor. And therefore Esther became the first lady of the colony and in fact was referred to, and Johnston made sure people referred to her as the first lady. Now when, and they built this really quite amazing house and settlement out at Annandale, and in fact when... Uh, Johnston eventually had to go back to England to face court-martial for his role in the Rum Rebellion. He stayed in England beyond his own trial to argue to the House of Lords because during the time that he was caretaker governor, they had made certain land grants. Some of those land grants they had made to Esther. And so he argued and didn't come back to Australia, didn't come back to New South Wales, until he had gained permission for Esther to retain entitlement to her land grants. So she's actually not only the first first lady, and she was the first woman to own land in her own right in Australia. It's a phenomenal story, and if you not uh, familiar with it, I urge you to look into the story of Esther Abrahams because she is a remarkable, uh, remarkable historical figure. And while we are in Australia, I'm just gonna, I just, um, it would be remiss of me if we were not talking about early, early Australia, which is really, I mean, you've got to realise that by the time you get to the year 1800, which is really the limit of where we're going in this course, it's only 12 years after the first fleet. You have to remember, if, if, I talk about, if I talked about the Ukraine being a boch, right? You've got to imagine, New South Wales in 1800 was a boch of bochs. Famously, you know, in that penal colony, they didn't put any fences or walls around it because they knew you wouldn't... If you ran away from there, you died. Yeah, well, whatever. I mean, you're not going to go and... Uh, you know, so, so it was, it was well, there's no flushing toilets going on there. <laughs> but uh, one of the most interesting episodes in the whole of Jewish history and the whole of Australian history and an episode that's actually quite well known amongst non-Jewish historians, but there's a fact that they don't always seem to appreciate about it. And I'm going to tell it to you. Some of you will be familiar with it. And that is the story, of course, of Joseph Samuel. Who is familiar with Joseph Samuel? It's the famous story of the man they couldn't hang. And it is divine intervention. Uh, it is, I'll just tell it again quickly because it's worth talking about. And it is, it is the story of, uh, of, of a man who, uh, he, a convict, he comes out and then uh, he escapes you know, with a group of mates. And by 1800, there are a few free settlers, people who served their time and have just decided to stay there, not catch the first boat back to England, but stay there. And so they rob this woman's house. And the course of which a policeman gets shot and killed. So the authorities go all out to round up this group of escapees. <clears throat> 
And the only one they find is Joseph Samuel, this Jewish convict. And they drag him in and they say, you're going to hang. And he said, look, I didn't kill anybody. I'll confess to the fact that I was part of the group that tried to rob the woman's house, but I never saw a policeman. I didn't kill anyone. I wouldn't kill anyone. That wasn't me. I'm innocent of that crime. And they said, we don't care. You're the only one we've found. Someone's got to hang for this. It will be you. And so in Parramatta, in 1801, on September the 26th, a huge crowd, there's no TV, so as have always been the case in history that public executions are entertainment for the masses, there's a huge crowd of several hundred people assembled at Parramatta to see this scrawny little Jew get hung uh, for his crime. And it was in fact not the only person hung that day. They hung another guy that also regarded, not for a different crime, that he, they were going to hang him. And uh, they brought him, and in those days they had not yet invented the trapdoor method of hanging. It was basically they put you on top of a cart, and then they put the noose around your neck, and they kick the cart away, and you're left strangling, dangling. It's a death by sto slow strangulation. It's awful. And uh, they put him on the cart, and uh, he the whole time is going, I didn't do it, I didn't do it, I'm innocent, I'm innocent. They put him on the cart, they kick the cart away, and poof, the rope breaks and he falls to the ground and breaks his ankle. <laughs> so they, meanwhile, the other guy they're hanging is he's in his death throes, and they pick Joseph Samuel up, and they put him back on the scaffold, and back on the cart, tie the noose around his neck again, kick the cart away, and again, having tested the rope, it's made of five hemp fibres, it can hold a thousand pound weight, Right, which is, what's this scrawny Jew going to wear, like 100 pounds, right? And they do it, kick the car, and again, it snaps. Bang, he falls to the ground. By this time, the crowd is getting very, very restless, right? Someone says, go, better call the governor, right? So they go and get the governor, king, right? But before, they, before king arrives, they pick Joseph Samuel up, who by this time is dazed and in shock. They pick him up and they put him back on the cart again. And the crowd's screaming, let him go, let him go. And the executioners just quickly want to deal with it. So they put him on the cart for a third time. And they kick the cart away. And for a... Th by the meantime, the other guy's dead already. <laughs> kick the cart away. And for the third time... The rope snaps, bang, he falls to the ground, by which time King arrives. They tell him what's happened, and he said, you have to let that man go. This is an officially recorded case of divine intervention. We cannot hang this man. 26th of September, 1801, was Yom Kippur. It's an amazing story, and it's true. It's recorded in the government annals and the people who were there who saw it. Three times they tried to hang this guy and three times the rope broke on Yom Kippur. And the whole time he's saying, I'm innocent of this crime. It's a very, very fascinating story. And the only really, the only ever officially recorded case of divine intervention in basically the whole of Western documented judicial history. And really uh, astonishing uh, astonishing episode but I'm going to finish off we'll just go quickly back to Europe as I said last week uh, we have um, we have several uh, Jews now who are rising to the fore not yet we're not yet at emancipation remember emancipation official emancipation is a 19th century story at the end of the 18th century however we are starting to see Jews who are rising above the limits that Jews have existed in to show the potential of what Jews have become. And last week we looked at uh, Rothschild and we looked at Mendelssohn. But there's one other I want to mention quickly that some of you will be familiar with, a figure living in London called Daniel Mendoza. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And Daniel Mendoza is classically in that category of Jews that made a room who's not familiar with Daniel Mendoza Daniel Mendoza was a boxer, but he was the, and he was the heavyweight champion of England. But he was the first boxer, you know, until Mendoza, until Mendoza, basically, 
boxing was you just stood there and you went bap and bang. It was a slugfest, right? Mendoza was the first person to actually develop what he called the science of boxing, the science of pugilism. I mean, I'm not saying that he was the first guy to work out that, you know, you can duck, right? <laughs> but he was certainly the first person to develop scientific ideas about stance, about movement, about how to, how to yeah, kind of moving, not quite the Muhammad Ali dancing yet, I mean, but the, the, just the whole science. And he wrote a book on the science of pugilism called The Art of Boxing. And he was, and what is famous about him, in fact, is he is the generally regarded as the first... This, I mean, his career as world champion, we're talking about 1792 to 1795, is his really active period of, of that. But he was the first Jew to meet the king. So he actually meets uh, George III. And that, you might say, oh, yeah, a Jew meets the king. Well, a Jew meets the king every day. But the fact that a Jew meets the king in the 18th century is a very, very big deal. Mendoza is a classic example of someone who is a Jewish person who rises out of the slums of the East End, because that's where he was, to become this in national and international figure, just as Rothschild did, just as Mendelssohn did. So that is really the story as we close the 18th century, that Jews are not yet emancipated, but some of the more talented Jews are pushing at the doors. Meanwhile, the Jewish world itself is growing. New territories are opening up. America is going to go on and become America. The great big wave of Ashkenazic immigration is still a hundred years away. That's the story of the end of the 19th century. Ellis Island and the millions of Jews coming into America. We're still only a few thousand in America, but it is already taking part in the whole civic story that is unfolding. And similarly, in Europe, things, you know, the Josephinian reforms in Austria towards the end of the 18th century, the French Revolution, we can start to see that things are going to be changing for Jews, but they may have to make some big sacrifices. Meanwhile, inside the Ottoman Empire, uh, the Holy Land struggles on uh, with its rabbis and its communities. This is now, we have several collective aliyot. The Gaon of Vilna sends several families to make aliyah. The Hasidic leaders send. They don't always get on. They're also not getting on with the Sephardim. We've got various tensions as they are establishing what is going to become known as the Yishuv Hayasham, the old settlement. Well, we're talking from the perspectives of Zionists. There's nothing old about it in the 18th century, but Zionists living a hundred years later are going to call it the old settlement. That's being formulated now in the 18th century. But what I want to tell you is you've been a great audience. Thank you for coming on this roller coaster ride of the 18th century to look at what I think is, for me, one of my favourite and most fascinating periods of Jewish history, where really uh, what we call the world today uh, is formed and, and how it emerges from that. So thank you so much for, for uh, following with all that. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed the talk. For episode notes and transcripts, or to learn more about David's next classes and projects, visit davidsolomon.online. You can also find David on Instagram or Facebook. Thank you. We hope to see you again soon. Bye.